whether you're a skeptic or a believer. Join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, The X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember Exxon Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. everyone this is the Exxon I am Rob McConnell and uh, we're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton Ontario Canada if you'd like to send me an email exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites exxon radio tv and to find out about the programming we have available for you on the radio side on the exxon broadcast network visit www.xzbn.net now, if you're a subscriber to Simul TV and you watch the Exxon TV channel, www.simultv.com. My guest this hour, Exxon Nation, is a gentleman that I wave to uh, when I'm on the shores of Lake Erie. He's in Pennsylvania, and I didn't know it was Ron until before I just used to go down to Lake Erie and wave, and I'd see somebody wave back. and <laughs> Just to find out it's Ron Murphy. He's an investigator into all things that go bump in the night. He uses a multidisciplinary approach to delving into the stuff of nightmares and illuminating the archetype that lurks in the shadows. I think I went out with her for a couple of nights in high school, but that's another story. He's written eight books on the paranormal and has investigated throughout the United States as well as the United Kingdom. Joining me now from his home in Pennsylvania, 
our guest this hour, Ron Murphy. And Ron, welcome to the Exxon. Great having you with us. Uh, Rob, thank you so much. It's a pleasure is all mine, my friend. Okay. Um, how did you get involved in the paranormal? Well, actually, it was my, my mom, if you can believe it. Uh, back in uh, the 1970s, I was just a wee lad, uh, so I was in elementary school. I was uh -huh. probably about s seven years old in 1977, and we had a rash of Bigfoot sightings in our area. Now, I come from a very small town, about 35 miles outside of Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. but it's like one of these one street light towns, and it's really you know, known for nothing until Bigfoot uh, started to be seen on the outskirts of town. And then the media started to come in. News trucks from Pittsburgh started to come in to our little town, all because of Bigfoot. So my mother, uh, she would uh, take my brother and I, and we would listen to the radio reports, and we would listen to the to the, um, to the the TV reports and read the reports in the newspapers. And then she would plot out a an area where we would go investigate to see if we could find any, any traces of Bigfoot. So from sure. a very early age, about the age of six or seven uh i was out looking for you know this this elusive uh mythological creature in a lot of people's minds but you know a flesh and blood creature in many other people's minds as well mm -hmm. but uh she instilled in me that sense of that the world is much bigger and much more mysterious than it seems to be ron why do you think in the year 2018 more and more people are getting more interested in the search for Bigfoot, uh, whereas other aspects of the paranormal, and I'm talking about ufology and uh, the investigation into the ghosts and hauntings, are on a decline. You know what? That's an excellent question. Um, and thinking about it from a paranormal perspective, you know, from mm -hmm. you know uh, somebody that is a true fan of the of, of the paranormal, um, I think it's because um, Bigfoot rest outside of technological bounds right uh, science has not categorized it it represents that wildness that mm -hmm. uncivilized part of humanity that we might never be able to tame now whenever we talk about ufos that's a very technological thing isn't it yes. we're talking about computers we're talking about things that are able to travel through time and space um and it's not that that wildness and that nearness and that we're very easily we can very easily identify with a wild man character other than something that came light years away or even for ghosts for that matter i think we've been so inundated in the media mm. uh, concerning ghosts and hauntings uh that we've kind of you know lost our nerve for it right. uh, and i think bigfoot is one of those things that people really kind of grasp onto and uh, they hope and i like me i hope mm -hmm. there is something out there I was just going to say, is it possible that because with Bigfoot, there is a bit better chance of someone actually seeing a Bigfoot than there is of a UFO and a ghost? It, I, I think, it, well, it's also very tangible, too, right, isn't it? exactly. Uh, yeah, ghosts are always going to be these ephemeral things, no matter if we catch EVPs mm -hmm. or, or fleeting videotape. It's always going to be something that's very subjective to the uh, to the witness. Uh, but whenever we have a Bigfoot, you know, it's something that leaves tracks. It's something that, you know, you people identify with smell. And it's something that we can actually reach out and grasp hold of. Is it also possible that there is the possibility that Bigfoot is related to us humans and that he has evaded uh, you know, uh, detection over the years and making him kind of a, not only a legend, but a feasible reality. Yeah, you know, Rob, and that that is also another good point, and that's the reason why whenever I write and I approach the subject mm -hmm. of the paranormal that I like to look at archetypes, um, because it really is embroidered in our DNA as a human race that these wild man creatures exist right on the periphery of civilization. All cultures around the world, whether we're talking about Africa or Australia or Europe or Asia, we all have the idea and the belief in a wild man yeah. character. You know, um, and, and that says a lot for who we are as human beings. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that we need them as much as uh, as much as they need us. Uh, and um, I, I think I kind of lost track on your point. But uh, I'm, I'm sorry if, if you would be kind enough to repeat it, because I was going off on this tangent. I thought, oh, I'm going to make a real good point about this. And then, and then I forgot what I was going to say. Well, first of all, you did make a very good point. And I was just saying that is it. Is it possible that because there's the distinct possibility that we are related to Bigfoot, mm -hmm. that this is where another attachment to the phenomena comes in? 
right. See, now this is where I'm going to plug my book. And that's Go probably right why I, yeah, Go right I'm, I'm not very good with self-promotion, but I wrote a book <laughs> called, yeah, uh, on, uh, on wild man tracking the Bigfoot through mm-hmm. history. And, uh, it was, it's just been, uh, re-released in its second edition and expanded edition. Um, and I also, I, I point out in the book that the idea of, um, interspecies breeding is something that we as a human race did experience you yes, know, that's right. about 50,000 years ago. Yeah. So we're talking about there are human beings in this world that have not only Neanderthal DNA in them, but also Denisovan DNA, which is this other kind of homo sapien dead end that nature kind of played around with and experimented with and it kind of lost the arms race to, to us homo sapiens. Um, so I think that there is this idea that um, it could be us. I mean, ever since I was a child, uh, I remember watching a, a, a TV a documentary called Bigfoot Man or Beast. So ever since I've been a kid, and probably since the time that this legend started mm-hmm. to surface among very different Aboriginal cultures, the idea that it could be one of us, a wild one of us, has always been there right below the surface. But you know what? That's something that a lot of people don't want to ab- admit either. You know, that's one of the skeletons in humanity's closet, the idea of inbreeding with a species outside of our own genetic makeup but it's a fact of life it is a fact of life you know about three percent of europeans have um have a uh, uh, neanderthal dna yes. and and the, the percentage of denisovan dna is much higher in uh the uh, uh aboriginal australians of, of all things if you can believe it so the idea that that this has happened and lingers with us to this very day is scientific proof Scientifically speaking, if Bigfoot is related to we Homo sapiens, why isn't there any protection against people harming Bigfoot in the quest to establish his reality? You know, uh, another excellent point. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons is because people don't want to take it seriously. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is uh, a pseudoscience. This is something out on the fringe. I think that there should be something in place, I truly do, just to eliminate a lot of whack jobs from going out in the woods with guns. I think that it would be a great thing. There was a show on uh, our TV down here in the States called um, Killing Bigfoot. I don't know if you had it up there or not. Well, well, we were going to, but I got an online petition going, uh, and the network that was going to air it back down, and they canceled it. And and that's probably for the best. And, And to tell you the truth, I mean, it was not... It, it almost followed the same formula as finding Bigfoot, mm-hmm. except whenever the people went out on their night investigations, they had high-powered rifles. I mean, right. that was the whole premise of the show: is to kill this creature, you know, that you know has has yet to be even proven by science. Um, I think that if you would put some sort of protective measures in there, uh, just make it simply unlawful to yeah. hunt a bipedal creature, that makes complete sense to me. I think there are some places on the books, uh, you know, kind of Mm tongue-in-cheek where some states have set aside that you cannot do this i think texas might be one of those places Uh, but the idea of going out there with a gun to shoot something walking on two legs whether bigfoot exists or not that's an accident waiting to happen it sure is ron please stand by you and i have to take our first break exo nation ron murphy is our very special guest this hour if you'd like to contact ron uh, ron find out more about him his books whatever www.ronmurphyjr.com. That's ronmurphyjr.com. And we'll both be back on the other side of this break, continuing this hour talking about Bigfoot here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Murphy's my guest for this hour, www.ronmurphyjr.com. 
www.bigfoothunters.com. And uh, Ron, why is it that the Bigfoot hunters or the Bigfoot researchers that we see on television always go out at night? Doesn't Bigfoot move around during the day? You know, I'll look at the Patterson Gimlin film. I mean, yeah, that exactly. was in, that was in broad daylight. Um, it, it 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 makes for better uh, video. I, I think it gives that kind of creepy aspect. Um, but you know, if you're looking for a creature out there, it doesn't matter if it's day or night. Mm -hmm. The idea of that it might be migratory at night. You know, the idea that this is nocturnal, first of all, should be thrown out because all credible sightings are usually take place in the daytime. That's what makes them so credible is because there's no identification or misidentification right. or eyewitness mistake on, on what they're seeing. Um, so yeah, the idea of going out there at night is, is is completely foolhardy for me you know we were talking uh earlier about uh go these this tv show where the guys were going out with high-powered rifles and and i agree with you it's an accident waiting to happen especially at night uh, but what do we know about bigfoot itself what do we know about his so social structure what do we know about bigfoot as a mom or a dad that's, and, and that's uh, another point. I mean, whenever we're talking about this from a scientific perspective, mm -hmm. all this stuff has to be addressed. Is there a mating season? Yes. Uh, do they do they go off into bachelor groups like some you know great apes do? You know what exactly yeah. is going on here? Um, I, I would think from a investigative perspective uh, that you know a group of Bigfoot is very rarely seen at one time so they, they apparently uh, move around in very disjointed bands or family bands or whatever if we have to make that kind of speculation of course that's what we're doing here is be having a speculation but there are reports from from uh, around where I I live right now dating back into the 1950s of uh, Bigfoot being seen with young ones. And every now and then you do hear reports of seeing a Bigfoot with a single young child. You know, that that's usually the way it goes. Right. I've never heard a report of multiple young ones uh, regarding Bigfoot. Um, so with that being said, is it possible that there are very, very few of these creatures? And then that's what I am uh, proposing. Um, for uh, when we look at the great ape species, there's only about 800 mountain gorillas left. Uh, and if you would look at this biologically, um, the minimal bio, viable population for the mountain gorilla is somewhere around 500 individuals before they start becoming, um, you know, uh, genetic mishaps and, and, and things like that, deformities uh, and dysfunctions. Um, so is it possible that possibly all of North America only has 800 of these animals. I mean, if, if that is the case, it's going to be very difficult to ever capture right. one of these things. Uh, they might be migratory. Uh, they might come together only certain times of the year for mating purposes. Uh, that could all be done with uh, with the use of pheromones as trail markers. Uh, so we can, you know, actually gather these creatures together over vast differences uh, by using very subtle biological components like infrasound or pheromones uh and uh, the the idea of seeing these creatures uh you know together is really limited if they only do uh, in fact come together just you know once or twice a year for for certain mating rituals and so it's very possible that we're talking about only you know a thousand individuals over north and south america and possibly even into canada and if that is the case it's going to be very difficult to ever ever mm -hmm. find one the fact that uh, most of the sightings or the majority of sightings with with smaller ones is a parent and one child also is a is a connection to the hypothesis that Bigfoot is related to Homo sapiens. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're not talking about them having a litter. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know. The other thing, there, there might be mm -hmm. uh, other Bigfoot in the area as well, too. There, there might be a sentinel or, you know, something on the lookout. So we really don't know what the family makeup is. Right. We could only say that they are, you know, if these are indeed um, related to the great apes and related to us, we have to look at what nature is providing us with um you know, to study. So we would look at the great apes and say, well, this is how they kind of go about the business, but they're very social creatures. Um, so if we do have a social, social group of Bigfoot, they keep their numbers hidden quite well. Isn't that why it is possible that, that Bigfoot has been able to survive as an unknown species is because of the care it takes in not socializing and getting out there 
where it can be seen and uh, and further exploited. Oh, absolutely. If you look through historical accounts of mm -hmm. Bigfoot, and I'm not just talking about accounts that are after the Patterson-Gimlin film right. or, you know, scant reports here and there about uh, wild men being seen uh, in the forest by uh, trappers, but if we go back into antiquity and we look at reports like the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is, you know, from Samaria, a report about a, a Bigfoot-like creature, these creatures are only encountered when um, the civilized man goes into uh, into the uncivilized world and starts mucking it up, you know, yeah. starts cutting down trees and things, um, and it, you can go through time and see that this is what's going on. There's an invasion of territory, and there is some sort of uh, reaction from these creatures. So, if they did indeed evolve alongside of us, they would know by this time that we are to be avoided. You know, and if that is the case, and they are self-aware creatures, so any creature like this that is able to be this elusive has to be self-aware. It has to know that it needs to stay hidden in order to survive. Um, then you could also talk about a culture. It's very possible these creatures are to the point that they have, you know, have harnessed some sort of culture. They might not, uh, you know, have, you know, fire or any kind of high functioning tool system or anything like that. But they may have a culture that involves some sort of, you know, burial even. So mm -hmm. whenever we talk about this kind of animal from a very speculative angle, mm -hmm. um, then we can see how how it almost like layers of an onion, how more and more difficult it may be to ever categorize this this creature. Where is your favorite place to investigate when you're out there looking for Bigfoot? Um, I do a lot of stuff on the Chestnut Ridge. My first book that I wrote on the paranormal was uh, called The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge, A Hike of the, into the Goblin Universe of Western Pennsylvania. Now, this is a place where there's not only numerous Bigfoot sightings, but also UFOs, plenty of haunted locations along that area. Even some some stretches of the land itself is considered to be haunted. Um, Thunderbird, um, Dogman, you know... You, really anything that you can name that is uh, beyond the realm of, uh, of uh, you know, reality is there. This is almost like the rabbit hole in uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, back since the 1970s, it's been called the Twilight Zone of Pennsylvania. So this is one of my favorite places to investigate. Uh, one of the reasons is if I look out my window, I can actually see it out my window. I've lived in the uh, foothills of the, uh, of the Chestnut Ridge uh, for 40 years of my 48 years here on this earth. Um, so but the other place, if I'm if I'm ever in Europe, uh, and I haven't been there for a bit, but I need to get back, uh, is in the Highlands of Scotland. They have a very interesting uh, creature over there called the Gray Man, which mm. is their version of uh, of a Bigfoot uh, type creature, a little bit more paranormal and a little bit more metaphysical in appearance and aspect. It seems to be very nebulous. It can kind of uh, shrink itself or or grow into tremendous sizes. Uh, but you know, the legend at at its basis is this bipedal wild creature uh, that haunts the uh, the the Highlands of, of Scotland. And also, there's a lot of different uh, wild tracks throughout England where the wood woose is said to be uh, said to be hiding and that is really the wild man where we get our 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 idea of the wild man figure before the Patterson Gimlin film came from this European tradition where do you based on the research that you've done into the Bigfoot where do you think the Bigfoot originates from Oh my goodness! That well, I, I think that it, if we're talking about this from a purely scientific point of view, mm -hmm. we would have to talk about an out of Africa migration. I think that if we're going to say that this is indeed a uh, uh, an evolutionary dead end, a remnant population that is a, was able to live uh, into uh, into the into history. an out of Africa movement and we have had and one of the reasons why I write about archetypes and from the Jungian perspective is that we probably had a co-evolution with these creatures when was the first once again based on your experience and the research you've done into the Bigfoot when was it first found in in history recorded history and um, where? Uh, Yep, uh, about 3500 BC. So we're talking, uh, this is uh, before the uh, pyramids are built, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're talking, you know, the ancient Sumerian culture. Wow. Uh, we have the Epic of Gilgamesh, and uh, this is whenever uh, the, the cultural hero Gilgamesh goes out and discovers a wild creature called Enkidu. Uh, and uh, 
it's not the only wild creature out there because in their adventures, Gilgamesh and Enkidu uh, end up going to a grove of trees. Now, you have to understand that this part of the world is very um, barren. So anytime you come to a, a large uh, gathering of trees, that's right. considered a sacred grove. Uh, but it had an inhabitant. And uh, that inhabitant was another one of these wild bipedal creatures. Uh, and uh, Gilgamesh promptly slays that creature and uh, starts tearing down the forest. So as you can see, uh, you know, from the very first encounter, it's never been a good one for these creatures. All right, Ron, please stand by. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exonation. Nation, Ron Murphy is our very special guest. And uh, Ron has uh, written eight books on the paranormal and has investigated throughout the United States and the United Kingdom. His website is www.ronmurphyjr.com, and we'll be back on the other side of this news break as we continue here in the Exxon with yours truly, Rob McConnell, and my special guest this hour, Ron Murphy, from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Whatever you do, don't go away. Ron Murphy is my guest, www.ronmurphyjr.com. He's the author of eight books. We're talking about Bigfoot this hour here in the X-Zone. Um, first of all, Ron, thanks very much for joining us. Great having you with us. Congratulations on all the all the work that you do. And uh, I, later on, I'd like to talk to you about the course that you're developing that is nearly completed. But right now, uh, I was wondering if you could explain your multidisciplinary approach to to uh the work that you do. Oh, uh, great. I, I would love to do that. Um, so I uh, went to the University of Pittsburgh, and I have my bachelor's degree in literature. And then I went to Indiana University of Pennsylvania, where I focused on history. Now, most of the history that I focused on was ancient to medieval. And mm -hmm. this is where a lot of these 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 archetypes started to show themselves. Um, you know, when we talk about the art of, uh, of, of England, uh, the medieval manuscripts, you had a lot of these wild man characters seen in, you know, books of prayer you know it's it kind of uh shows you what is out there the wild the uncivilized to stay away from but uh through all my courses uh, from the very beginning of school uh, i start seeing this creature that i loved so much in my youth emerging again and again this idea of a a you know this dead end right. uh in in humanity that was considered to become extinct you know when we talk about uh the gigantopithecus and such um but then i started to, to try to make connections and think well is it possible that there are still populations of these creatures out there and people are still seeing them today? So then you look at sociology and see how that can be applied to that and how groups, you know, the mob mentality can somehow um, influence uh, eyewitness sightings and linguistics. So whenever we look at, you know, Native American uh, uh, folktales of these creatures on the West Coast, and then we see that there's an East Coast equivalent as well, sometimes even linguistically, well, there's something to be said about that there's some some sort of connection to be made Definitely. so whenever we look at all these different things you know through if we're looking at history and we're looking at literature and we're looking at biology we can start connecting the dots a little bit better and we can see that this creature does uh exist at least in our minds, in our collective unconscious, if you will, you know again to go back to Carl Jung. So the idea of the collective unconscious is that we as um a human race, a species have a cultural memory of this being and it has influenced us so much that it sticks with us to this very day um i like that idea 
Um, as an investigator, I'm still out there looking. I still have never seen anything. I've had some anecdotal evidence. I've had some tantalizing things happen to me, like a wood knock and some calls and things. But I've never physically seen this creature. Um, so as an investigator, looking at this creature in the woods is one thing, but also trying to track it through the gray matter of the mind is something completely different, but just as appealing to me. Well, you know, everybody, uh, I, I put Bigfoot in the same category as God. Nobody has seen God yet. Millions of people around the world believe that God does exist. That's so why, why couldn't the same model apply to not only Bigfoot, but other other cryptids as well as other categories uh, within what you and I call the paranormal? Uh, absolutely, that's that's the case, isn't it? I mean, a lot of people do see this mm -hmm. as a quasi-religion, don't they? I mean, this is something to be defended. There's no way really to disprove anything that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a matter of you know, subjective faith whenever we're talking about matters of this nature. Um, of course, we can be as scientific as we possibly can, but in the end of the day, we're not going to be able to take a, a push pin and tack a Bigfoot under a uh, an investigative lens, are we? Not yet, anyway. Yes, not yet anyway. And I'm hoping that that doesn't happen because we need that wildness. We need that. We need to be kept in our place as a human species to show that we are are capable of, uh, you know, of not destroying something that coexists on this earth with us. Uh, I agree with you, but then I have to ask you, then, why search for Bigfoot, then? Uh, well, I, I think that it's all... It's everybody's quest for the Holy Grail. I think everybody has something to do. And and mine is uh, to try to get to the source of what has been um, uh, infecting my dreams since I've been a uh, an elementary school student. Right. Uh, and, you know, to other people, I think there's a, a true scientific quest out there. Uh, some researchers are very religious, getting back to the idea of God. And uh, that can point out, you know, this idea of creation over evolution. There's a lot of different reasons why people do it. But I think the ultimate goal is everybody likes a mystery and everybody wants to be the one to solve that mystery. This is a great puzzle. This is a conundrum that could possibly be walking in the very forest that we look out our window and see. So if that is the case, I think that uh, a lot of people want to solve this mystery for sure. themselves. Ron, is there a Bigfoot paranormal connection outside of cryptozoology? Uh, uh, see, uh, as a researcher, and this is whenever it becomes a, a bit more ambiguous, okay. uh, again, we talk about the idea of a culture or the idea of them burying their dead or possibly even ritualistic cannibalism or something of that nature. But we have to go by a lot of eyewitness reports of these things disappearing, of, you know, red glowing eyes, of sometimes telepathy. Um, I've had a number of reports of these, of these creatures materializing in somebody's home. I don't know if you've heard any of these stories up there in Canada, or Rob, or not, but I've heard at least a handful just in my neck of the woods here in Pennsylvania. One lady said she was um, uh, vacuuming the floor, and this creature materialized inside her living room and wow. had to actually you know, bend over because it was so tall, and it communicated with her uh, telepathically. And it would come and go, uh, you know, observe her doing chores around the house. At first, she was scared out of her mind, but then it became um, just just something that was going on. So, you know, as as somebody that has been trained to, um, you know, observe human behavior, uh, I, I knew that she wasn't making the story up, and she herself believed this story. So you can put it off as some sort of fantasy, something that was going on in her mind, until these stories keep on cropping up. Other people saying, yes, you know what, that had happened to me, or somebody coming out of the blue and saying, uh, you know, have you ever heard of a Bigfoot visiting you inside your home? So whenever we hear these encounters, what are we to make about it? We're still dealing with a very tall, bipedal, hair-covered animal, right. uh, but now it's speaking to us, or it's vanishing, or it's able to manipulate the world around us. Um, that, of course, is a paranormal connection, and it's something as a legitimate researcher that I can't, I, I can't dis, dis, discard it. You know, I can't simply uh, uh, roll it up and toss sure. it in the garbage can because it doesn't fit into my schema on how these things are supposed to operate. So, 
Bigfoot could be a multi-dimensional multiverse. Uh, could be uh, some sort of entity that has figured out how to manipulate the time-space continuum, uh, travel backward and forward in time. There are so many possibilities. But once, once again, it goes back to what you were saying, that because we do not know, everything is on the table. Everything is on the table. So as I'm writing and researching, I come back uh, more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've said this on very, very few programs. So this will probably be one of the first times uh, that, you know, listeners are hearing this theory. And I would love to hear uh, anything that they uh, would have to say in regards to this. Because, you know, these, these radio shows are great forums for people to get together and share opinions and share theories. But one of my theories that I'm dealing with right now is Bigfoot. Uh, as, as a denizen of the world of the fae, of the, the fairy realm. Yes. Now, a lot of times whenever you use the word fairy, right. you automatically think of Tinkerbell and Walt Disney comes to mm -hmm. mind. Uh, but when we talk about uh, an, an elemental earth energy that um, exists out there and is able to um, manipulate the world around it so we see it. It can actually project itself into us. Now, it, when we look at medieval reports of, of fairies, they had something called glamour, which is a way that they can physically change the way they are being seen. Um, so we're talking about some sort of possible psychic connection or something going on there. But they're able to put into our minds a vision of the way that they want to be perceived. Uh, and a lot of tells of Bigfoot seem to have that going on there as well. Uh, there are also tells in the Pacific Northwest where Bigfoot has offered food, and if you would take the food, you go into the world of Bigfoot. That is something that is also very curiously related to the European folklore, yet it's showing up in Native American legends as well. So, you know, we start you know, connecting dots again, yeah. like I said. So when we look at the Yowie in um, Aboriginal Australia, uh, you know, and that culture is quite ancient. You know, we're going back almost 60,000 years. Uh, and we have the idea of the dream time, this time out of time mm -hmm. where certain beings exist. And Yowie seems to be one of those beings. Uh, it looks as if these creatures might be um, – coming and going into our world in possible waves, you know, whether intentional or unintentional, but it seems like they might not be grounded completely in corporeal reality. So uh, it gives you something to think about, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it certainly, it certainly <laughs> does. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my final break now while I ponder that very interesting and very plausible situation. Ron Murphy is our very special guest this hour, XO Nation, www.ronmurphyjr.com. And uh, if you'd like to uh, find out, uh, where can our listeners get your books, Ron? Uh, you know, you can go to Amazon. You can also go right to my website as well. Um, you can go to your bookstore, but I, you know, yeah. I, the paranormal sections tend to be getting smaller and smaller unless you're, yeah. you know, hunting for vampires or some, something like that. So uh, you could go to your bookstore and order it, but it's easier to go on Amazon. And if you're a prime holder, it costs nothing to ship the books, or you could just get them directly from me and I'd be happy to autograph them or whatever. All right. We'll be back on the other side of this break. And by the way, that's not a Bigfoot, that's his pussycat on that, his back. Yeah. The, Mr. Possums. Mr. Possums. Ron Murphy and I return. Don't go away. Ron Murphy is our special guest this hour, Exonation, www.ronmurphyjr.com. Um, first of all, Ron, I want to thank you ever so much for joining us. It's been a delight having you with us. I've thoroughly enjoyed our, our, our conversation. 
We're going to have to have you back on because still there's so much more that we have yet to discuss. But uh, before we get back to the Ferry uh, Bigfoot connection, let's talk about a course that you've got going or you're going to get going very shortly. Tell our listeners about it. Well, in the real world, um, I actually uh, I, I work in education, mm-hmm. uh, and I am in the process right now with a fellow teacher of mine by the name of Angela uh, Bukama. Uh, we're actually uh, designing a uh, nature preschool, a forest kindergarten, if you will. I'm not sure exactly how they're referred to uh, up in Canada, uh, but there's only one other one in Pennsylvania, and that's on the other side of the state. They're very rare mm. uh, here uh, in the U.S. They're, 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 they're a bit in vogue in Europe, um, but, you know, ever since I've been a kid, I've been out in the woods and I've learned some of the the most uh, that I've ever learned out in nature. And I think that that's a very important link for us not to forget. You know, we're, we're all uh, geared up with our iPhones and our yeah. iPods and iPads and everything. Um, and I think it's time that we step back from technology a little bit. Let's use technology as a tool and not as a babysitter and get, you know, get our children really out there. Uh, one of the reasons why I want to do this is because it does indeed teach stewardship, uh, not only of, uh, of each other, uh, but also of the land itself. And that's extremely important. Um, you know, there's an old maxim that, uh, we borrow the world from our children. Children. And I think that is true, but I think the children need to have a hand in how they're going to lend this world out. Um, and I, I'm really excited about the possibilities of this catching on uh, and just a true wonder that nature provides to us uh, free of charge. Uh, and of course, uh, Socrates says, uh, wonder leads to wisdom. And I think that's very true. Some of my most fascinating moments in my life and some of my most memorable moments in my life has taken place outdoors. Yeah. I think that you, that's probably the same for you too. Rob. That is, yes. Uh, yep. And, and I want to instill that in children because I don't think kids are really doing that anymore. Don't take this wrong, but what is the difference between what you are going to be accomplishing and what the Boy Scouts and Girl Guides? That's see, and that's that's the other thing, and that's a very important connection. Um, a lot of children simply don't have that in their lives. Wow. And we're talking about, you know, a, a group that meets maybe one or two times a month compared to, um, you know, five days a week for 180 days. And I think that is what I'm really trying to get in there. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I want to show the impact that, you know, that we play uh, in the world around us. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to push for right now on the designation of this course is the idea of working with um, certain animals that may be in- extinct by the time these children um, graduate from high school oh gosh, uh, yeah. there's a species of chicken called uh, the dorking chicken I don't know if you have any uh, working knowledge of chickens no I don't uh, yeah, but this is a very ancient breed. I didn't either until I started to design this course. Uh, but Julius Caesar actually referenced these in his writing. So mm-hmm. uh, this was a chicken that was brought to England b- uh, by way of Rome, and uh, you know through the years it's lost its its its, it's you know uh, appreciation. Uh, it's not a very large bird. Uh, it's not a very good leg a- uh, egg layer, uh, and it's actually at a very critical stage, and it may not be um, you know around much longer. So we're seeing an entire species species of animal that probably will be extinct in the next 12 years. And I would like the children to be able to work with an animal like this to show that, you know, it's humanity's decision whether this animal lives or dies based solely on, you know, uh, preferences. And uh, I want to show them that, you know, real life is is in their hands. And, uh, you know, there's an appreciation for all life. And I think that if you take that, it extends also into, you know, life uh, as a whole, you know, yeah. with your fellow beings on this planet as well. Well, it's a, it's about time we start spreading a, a, a chance for peace instead of this constant hate that seems to fill the air. Yeah, my entire knowledge when it comes to, to chickens can be wrapped up in three little alphabets. KFC. Well, <laughs> see, the thing is, my friend, <laughs> I am a big chicken fan myself. That's true. And I've never raised a farm animal in my life. Right. But I'm trying to give these these, these little ones, you know, yeah. a kind of a complete working knowledge, you know, to, to this kind of gestalt type of uh, of education. So, but I agree with you. Uh, yeah. You know, that actually sounds good. I think whenever I get off here tonight, <laughs> I might have to hit up the good old KFC. No, I, 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 I admire what you're doing. And it It will change lives. And all we need to do, the goal of this entire show for the last 28 years, going on 29 years on air, is to make a positive difference in one person's life. Uh, Look, tonight... 
we talked about very uh, you know various topics, mm -hmm. and some of them were you know quite controversial. Whenever we're talking about investigation, there was no arguments whatsoever. No, uh, you were not one of these shock jocks where people like to you know get a rise out of people. This was a very sane conversation, and the reason why you've been doing this for such a long period is because people can understand that and they can sense that. That's the reason I cannot wait to hear feedback from this show because I really. I, you know, as a writer and, and as a, a lecturer, I truly do listen to what my audience has to say, and, I, and I'm looking very much forward to hearing what the response is. But you see, this is what communication is all about, and somewhere along the line, it was forgotten that communication is a two-way street. It's called talking and listening. <laughs> and I don't know where it went wrong, but it's nice to see people like yourself and others out there who are getting back to basics and saying, hey, listen, you've got something to say. I've got something to say. You say what you've got to say. I'll listen, and then I will do the same. So there you go. Uh, um, before the break, we were talking about the fairy Bigfoot connection, and I'd like to get back into that because it raised a lot of excellent points. It, it does. Uh, and, and I think that if we look at this, let's look at it from a European point of view. Okay. So we have a fairy creature out there, something that, you know, uh, the Woodwoos, for instance, their version of Bigfoot okay. uh, is um, almost like a fairy creature. By the time we get up to the Arthurian legends, we have Sir Gawain and the Gr Green Knight. And the Green Knight is indeed this kind of mythological woodland figure covered in leaves. Uh, so we see that there's a slight evolution in this, but we're always dealing with a creature that's so a part of nature that it actually can... Uh, regenerate itself with the passing of the of the seasons. Um, so you, sometimes you see the the green man and the wood woos with different color hair or different color leaves to represent the winter or the the fall coming around. Uh, so that's one point. We have this idea with this creature being intrinsically linked mm -hmm. with uh, the natural world, very similar to the fairy. Right. Now, um, uh, by the time we get up to Shakespeare. We have in A Midsummer Night's Dream a character by the name of Robin Goodfellow, who in his play is called Puck. Now, Puck is taken from the word Puka, P U C C A, and that represents a shape shifting creature uh, that is part of the fairy realm. Uh, now, linguistically, uh, let's cross the Atlantic here, and then whenever we come to uh, Massachusetts, there's a creature up there that inhabits the woodlands, which is very similar to uh, a small Bigfoot in stature, and its name is the Puck Wedgie. So we have the Puka and the Puck Wedgie with the same type of root-sounding words in there. So is it possible that this is indeed related, and this is what the creatures themselves want to call themselves and the cultures around them kind of pick that up it's something very fascinating to look at but again we see this idea of, of a same name crossing not only time and space but also you know cultures as well when it comes to the cryptozoological groups is information shared or it does it does everybody hold on to whatever information they have because they don't want to you know, share the information so that somebody else may find the smoking gun. Uh, that's, that's you, you hit the nail on the proverbial head. That's mm -hmm. exactly what's going on. Uh, or some people will get information and because it doesn't make any sense to them, they will throw the information away because they thought, you know, it's ludicrous instead of documenting it. Some people think that all the information they get is completely proprietary. I think that information should be confidential but never proprietary. It needs to be shared. Um, I used to host uh, uh, a, a few podcasts, as a matter of fact, and there is so much infighting in this field and so many people jockeying for position that I simply did not have the palate for it. I, I could not stand it. I'm not, I'm not an assertive person. I'm not one of these people that like to be uh, put into uh, an argument of any kind. Uh, so I really have taken a step back, and, and now I let my, my books speak for themselves or I'll do lectures. But, uh, you know, this is one of the safe spots that I've had right. uh, on radio for quite some time without any kind of bickering or any kind of, you know, uh, in-your-face confrontations. And I really do enjoy this approach very much. Um, I think that if we are ever going to be taking um, seriously, scientifically, uh, that uh, we have to be, uh, you know, friendly. 
um, uh, Benjamin Radford of the uh, Skeptical Inquirer magazine yeah. said that um, it's not outside forces that make the Bigfoot investigator look foolish. It is the Bigfoot investigators themselves, and that is absolutely the case, or any paranormal investigator. Um, there's a lot of experts out there, my friend. Um, I know a lot about history. I know a lot about you know different types mm -hmm. of you know sociology, and I know a lot about the mythological and the folklore approach to these creatures, but nobody is an expert on this stuff. Uh, nobody knows if these creatures actually exist, and that's why we always have to keep an open mind. And we can never put a period at the end of any sentence that has to deal with the paranormal. It always has to end with a question mark. Speaking about ending, my friend, you and I have to say so long for tonight. I want to thank you ever so much for your time and explanation. If you'd like to find out more about our guest this hour, Ron Murphy, his website is www.ronmurphyjr.com. And I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exome from our broadcast center and studios in beautiful Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Ron, we'll have you back on in the future, so don't go too far. Thank you. It was a pleasure, my friend. Good night now. Bye -bye. We'll be back, Exxon Nation. Don't go away. <laughs>